אסטרית בלצן, שלום. שלום, שלום. And welcome to Culture Buzz. Hello. אסטרית, <laughs> you are a talented pianist, a performer, a musician, an educator. <laughs> in the last... Well, in the last 20, few... 22 decades, years or something, yeah. You have educated the Israeli public when it comes to classical music. And L let's just say that I, I have a dream to create a new audience for classical music. Because I feel that my art, the art that I decided to devote my life to, is dying in front of my eyes. There is a lesser audience. The age, the age of the audience is growing older and grow older. And there are fewer of them. And young people, they don't seem to even start to care about it. It's beyond their reach. They come from the decibels of rock and roll. And what do they know about uh, this niceties? And still, correct me if I'm wrong, there are so many wonderful young talents who are working very hard when it comes to classical music. We keep well, producing wonderful musicians. Well, listen, we are Jewish here. And Jewish people are a people that likes to study. So there is hope. That last, like the culture, there is hope, but the hope is not in the, in the hands of those whose profession it is to become a musician. Because what will they do le later? Mm -hmm. I, there has to be an audience for them. Mm -hmm. Because as wonderful as they can be, without an audience, right. they will not be able to persist and insist to make good music. So well, luckily for us, for Israel, <laughs> we have Asterid Balzan, making sure that there will be audience. Well, I, I, I thought that if Le Lenny Bernstein did it so wonderfully in the 60s. And Glenn Gould. And Glenn, not, not to a wide audience, okay. not in front of an audience. Glenn Gould was in his studios. It's surprising that you say it, because my first, uh, the, the first recital of my next tour starts in Glenn Gould's studio. Ah, wonderful. And for me, Glenn Gould is God, really. When it comes to Bach? When it, when it comes to a musician, not to, to a thinking pianist. I don't know. Not I, to I, I don't want even, you know, when you come to such a talent, to such a genius, yeah. I hate to judge. Who am I? Yeah. This is really a talent beyond belief. Absolutely. There was nothing like it. A and it's a brain A true genius. A yes, true and, genius. and also the words and the analysis, you know, it's, it's, right. it's, uh, it's something absolutely marvel. But still, Glenn Gould didn't find the, he, his way to a wider audience. He had his own audience and he had such a, such a myth uh, behind him, right. that the audience came to him. Right. We are not that lucky today. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there is a living pianist who is a myth now. After the death of Horowitz and Rubinstein, mm -hmm. there is no one living myth. So you see a decline. Yes. Not only in the piano department, it's in the music, in the classical music, and let's say in the, in the music as a, as a true art form, not as an entertainment. But Not as a dancing. But let, let us give a room for optimism. And I've said before that there is hope. And this is the topic of our conversation today. We are going to discuss, thanks to your wonderful efforts, very deep research, and your amazing findings. We would like to discuss here today with you, Astrid, Hope, Hatikva, the national anthem of the State of Israel, because we are about to celebrate Israel's birthday. Uh, 64th in, anniversary, yes. In uh, 24 hours, um, a bit more than 24 hours uh, from now. So, what can you tell us a street about Hatikva? Um, well, it's our national anthem. It's an old anthem. It was created uh, 126 years ago. First, there were the words written by Naftali Herzimber in Galicia, which is, it was Poland, today it's Ukraine. Ukraine. And uh, then came the melody. 
and uh, it has been the anthem not only of Israel but of the Jewish people ever since the beginning of the 20th century. Because the national anthem is much older than the state than of Israel. Than the state of Israel. Actually, it's double. It's twice wow. the age of Israel. Wow. Israel is 64, then the national anthem will be around 126, 28 years. Amazing. So uh, the whole thing of, uh, of uh, researching a national anthem fascinated me. Because I have to confess, I have a little bit of a guilt complex. I come from a very Zionistic family. My father was a journalist. The family lived in Kishinev, Russia. Wow. And they were in the first uh, Zionist Congress. They were members. And here I am in Israel, uh, playing uh, Beethoven and Chopin and Bach. And I always remember my father telling me, yeah, it's very nice that you are cultured and you play Schumann and Beethoven and Brahms and Chopin, but what about Jewish music? Is there no such thing as classical Jewish music? To answer this simply, no. There is no such thing as classical Jewish music in, in, the, in the frame of mind of a concert hall because as Jews we were never permitted to celebrate. We were never permitted to have musical life in the synagogue. We were never permitted to have an orchestra there. So the whole education for music that for the Catholics begins in the Catholic Church. In the Jewish diaspora it was the poor people. But, but despite of that, uh, when were, we have Jewish composers, there were some wonderful composers, right? And, but they were and, they all and performers and performers, but only performers in the 20th century and composers only after they change their religion, like Mendelssohn, like Mendelssohn Mahler, or Mahler. Mahler. They have to change. These are the two. Yes, they great have to become Catholic. Examples. They have to change in order it, to make it as in a order, composer. In order to make it. So, is there such thing as classical music? which is really Jewish and known all through the world. So I decided to do something for Israel. In, it was for Israel's 60th birthday anniversary. I decided to investigate the national anthem. And we are grateful that you did. And I, 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 I was looking for a linkage, for something that will connect the anthem to the concert hall. And of course, I thought about this piece. A question, if I may. Yes. When was this composed by Smetana? In the same year that Hatikva poem was written, 1878. A coincidence? Or? And it was in Sweden, because he was in diaspora. Uh, it wasn't in Prague. You are referring to Smetana? Yes, I'm referring was to Was he Smetana. deaf already at the time? No. No. No, but he was uh, already in the procedure of becoming deaf. Okay. So, uh, for many years I was thinking it's stolen. But then I started investigating and I found out that he said that the melody is not his own. This is not his melody, he said. He said that he deliberately chose a melody that will suit all the people of East Europe. That it's a wandering melody. Jews use it, gypsies use it, these Czechs the, use it. These are the words of Smetana? These are the words of Smetana. Okay. So, if Smetana said it in 1878, it means that the origin of the melody comes before. So where is it from? So you had to dig deeper. 
I had to dig, to, to dig deeper and I came across a Polish melody, a Swedish melody, a Jewish prayer. Yigdal Elohim chai ve'it gadash melo Hashem gevurato. How old is this uh, prayer? 18th century. 18th and century. still I had to go deeper and the most ancient melody that I found was this. Yich l'shalom g'eshem uvo b'shalom tal k'irav l'oshia u'moridatal ha'shir shirati v'asim dibrati v'agbir asvati l'tzur yeshuati This is from 1400. Amazing. Spain. Amazing. It's written by Rabbi Yitzchak Bar Sheshet. Uh-huh. It's Birkat Tral. Tal, Birkat Tal, which means a prayer for the dew. Right. You say it every Passover. Right. You say bye-bye rain, lech l'shalom geshem, come in peace, uvo b'shalom dew. Wow. Uvo b'shalom tal. Now, the fact that the origin is Spain is the solution to much of the mystery. Because the Jews of Spain were expelled? Ex- yes, expelled. Expelled. Yes. 1492. Had, in 1492. Yes. So they had to move all, all across Europe. First they went to Holland and the Dutch and the Italy. And from there on they went to the Balkan area, right. to Turkey and to Romania. Correct. So I found out that this melody is taken from two origins. The first, the, the scale, the minor scale, is from the Spanish tune. But this part is not in the prayer. This come, f- comes from a Romanian folk song that goes like this. Ce electricitate, ce fera de si vapor In canu a rau aflate, mergea toate fara zi Faci pătrenii erau moi, își minau ca nu behind our anthem, and not even one is true. The poet is not Imber. Half is Imber, and half is corrected by Matmon Cohen. Matmon Cohen. And the composer is not folk, it's half Sephardic Jew, half Ashkenazi Jew. So it was quite, it's quite, quite a way, 600 years old way this is for amazing. one tune. This is amazing, Astrid. Basically, what you are describing here is a wonderful fusion. Some may even describe it as confusion. But the end result is the Israeli national anthem. And what's nice about it, what's really deep about it, is the fact that our our national anthem is really a portrait of ourselves. We are this kind of people. And our history. And our history. We, were, we are a wandering people. Scattered, we are a, scattered, scattered all over the world. Scattered all over Europe. Expelled uh, throughout Europe. With refugees everywhere. And the fact that the anthem, even the melody, is not one tune, but taken from different uh, ages and different countries in different places. And the words were half from the diaspora by Imber, and then the correction by Matmon Cohen is also an Israeli correction of the Jewish origin. Mm-hmm. I think this is very, um, this is an insight to the soul of these people. I see. We have this split soul. That's our merit, and that's also our deficiency. Uh-huh. We doubt everything. We right. dispute about everything, even about this anthem. Right. You know how many times in the Israeli parliament everybody said, we had to change this anthem? 
for various reasons, because the name of God is not in the anthem. So maybe we have to take This is from the Bible, maybe this should be the anthem. That's what Shai Agnon said in 1932. And then somebody else came and said, we need an energetic anthem. Bialik, the national poet, was Bell Katz and Nelson, also in the 30s, and they wrote a march. A Basque melody. A Basque melody. A Basque melody. Although Nomi Shemer, from what I know, had denied this. A week before her death. Yes, in writing. In writing, she published a letter right. saying that she had to confess. To Gil Aldema. To Gil Aldema, that she has to confess that yes. She heard it? She heard it once. She heard it once with Paco Ibanez in Echal Atarbut. She thought she doesn't know it, but unconsciously it found its way to her best song. Of course, this is original, and that's the climax of the same song. But this is Fardic, and again we come to the same formula of the national anthem, half and half. Half Sephardic, half Israeli. And again the insight that this country is nothing without the diaspora. Mm -hmm. We cannot wipe it out. Mm -hmm. Even in our most original songs, 2,000 years of diaspora could not vanish. Which is a healthy thing, if I may say so. I think it's, a, it's something to understand, and once you know it, you accept much more right. the complex character of this country and these people, and you learn to be proud of it. Especially when Israel is one of the youngest of all world nations when it comes to the modern state of Israel. But thanks to the music, we can, see, we can, we can show some very deep roots. Yes. So I've published the book. I published it. Uh, the Ministry of Education published it. It's a book, 200 pages long, two CDs, and three hours of If music. I may say so, it's a wonderful book. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now it's obligatory for the matriculation exams Very in good. schools. Very good. I do it for every end of the uh, officer's course in the Army. In the Army. And, uh, and I feel that I did something for my family. Because in my eyes, Hatikva, the hope, is also Hagava, pride. To be proud of it. Astrid, not only that you have done this for your family, you have done it for all the people of Israel, and I think many people all over the world who happen to be Jewish, and many others who were always intrigued about the whereabouts of the Israel's national anthem. <laughs> so, I would like to express my personal gratitude, and I'm sure that all of our viewers are having now the same feeling. I would like to wish you all the best in your coming North American tour that will take you both to Canada and to the United States. It will end in the 19 Second Street Y in Manhattan. So all the best, and I know that there are more tours coming uh, up, even, even down under. <laughs> Australia is next. So, toda uh, raba, and maybe this is the best time uh, to wish Israel happy birthday, 
and to thank Astrid Balzan for contributing so much to our knowledge when it comes to our national anthem. One last thing Please. about this anthem. Uh, I love this country. I did my doctorate in Manhattan School of Music. I was a Juilliard student. I could, I could have remained there. I came back and I have three children and a musical family and I'm very proud to be here. I think this is our place. I love this country. But I know it's a problematic place to live in. And it was a special treat to me to find out that even in this little one minute anthem, the complication of our life in Israel is musically expressed. And I want to show something, and forgive me for Please. showing something no, that no. is a, a true musical analysis. Please. What's really the problem? There is this phrase in the anthem. <laughs> Now, in the, there is a symphonic orchestration of the anthem that was done by a, in an Italian orchestration, a very well-known conductor of an orchestration, but an, oh no, an orchestrator, Bernardon, Bernardino Molinari, who also orchestrated Debussy Lille Joyeuse. He was wow. really an authority in okay. orchestration. He has done this before, Paul Ben Chaim? Yes. Okay. He, he has done this in, uh, in the 10th anniversary for the Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra, which is 1946. Now, he put his hand, his finger, on the conflict in. Here. To be a living people in our land. A free people. It's very simple. Right. But Molinari said, Arzenu, our land, is not our. We have to fight for it all the time. Uh -huh. Therefore, Arzenu, our land, get this chord, an augmented seventh chord. Wow. Now, when you hear the, this chord, Is it really art saying? A question mark. Maybe there is another people who wants this land. Uh -huh. So we have to fight for this land, and therefore many people think life in Israel are terribly difficult. They are difficult, but they have a vision. Mm -hmm. You want to be a free nation in your land. succession of dominant sevens unsolved chord, which sounds like a dissonance, resolving to a dissonance, resolving to another dissonance, resolving to another dissonance, resolving to another dissonance, and yet to another dissonance after seven gates. This was truly a delight. Thank you and happy Yom Ha'atzmaut.